Welcome everybody to BC Kidney Day's 2016 meeting, Transitions, the Kidney Patient Journey. I'm going to introduce myself quickly and then I'll allow my co-chair to have a quick word of introduction and then we'll get into just some opening comments before we start with the program. So I'm Dr. Caroline Stigant. I'm a nephrologist in Victoria. This is um, the second year that I've had the honor to chair this meeting um, and I think we've put together a pretty great program today. Um, I'll have some further words today after you hear from Dr. Johnson. Thanks, Caroline. Um, my name is Alwyn Johnston. I'm a transplant nephrologist at FGH, and uh, this is my first year co-chairing uh, this meeting. Um, and um, I hope that you all enjoy our program. Um, and Caroline is going to give you some housekeeping, got some introductions, and uh, I'll be doing most of the talking tomorrow. So thank you. Great. Uh, so just by means of a quick introduction, there's 480 registrants at this meeting. Um, it's a sold out meeting, so we're, we're so thrilled that you're all here. Yeah. Um, we have delegates here from all over BC. We have some from out of province, I think as far away as Ontario, so welcome to our guests as well from other provinces. Um, I just want to allow people who are coming in late to um, see that there's lots of room up at the front still. I see some seats up at the front. Don't be frightened. Front row center is a really good seat. Lots of seats up at the front row. There's some added incentives for you coming close to the front. You'll know what I mean when you get to your seat. So don't feel you have to crowd um, at the back door. Um, normally at this time in a meeting we'd say to turn these devices off, but actually for this meeting we need everybody to have this at hand. This is your little conference tool. You may have noticed that this is a paperless meeting. Um, so because it's 2016, we're going paperless and uh, we are on the West Coast, thought it was a good idea. Um, and everything that you need is online. So if everybody could just please mute their phones, but please have the conference app handy. I think we had the slide up there. And there's also uh, an information sheet on everybody's table on how to use some of the features of this app. But you can just play through it um, quickly. You can see the, pr the entire program is there. The layout of the venue is there. Everybody who's registered, the speakers, the speaker's bio, um, all the information you're going to need is there. And there's even a session eventually on evaluation. We'll talk a little bit more about evaluation in just a moment. I want to um, just start um, by means of some of this technology with um, an introduction to the live polling. So if you um, look at those instructions on your sheet and if you all have your device in front of you, um, on the main page of the app in the top left corner there is a menu, a little drop down menu screen and there's a polls and feedback. And if you all go into that, that enables you to do live polling because we, we really hear every year that people love to be involved. They love to give us feedback. So we're asking for your feedback. If you go into that feature, you then see the list of <coughs> meetings. And if you just click on the welcome and announcements, you'll see there's a nice little questionnaire. Last year, I did this question with a show of hands, but this year we'll use our technology. So if you want to just click on which kind of healthcare professional you are or which kind of meeting attendee you are um, and submit your question, then we can get a nice little summary here of a quick intro of who is in our audience. Now, I can't see that so well, but I'm guessing that big red bar is nurses. Oh, it's right in front of me. My gosh, I can see it. Okay, we've got a nice mix of everybody. Welcome, everybody. So that's great. You, get, you got to use the technology and just remember how that works because um, our first speaker um, is going to be using that for asking you further questions. Um, also, there's door prizes, so another reason to register. Um, so... It's nice to get a door prize. We've got some nice ones this year. Four Seasons Hotel, breakfast at the U restaurant, and dinner at the U restaurant, too. I'm told it's really nice. Um, we also, just finishing up on the social media theme, um, please feel free to, um, to tweet about the meeting, um, again, in a manner that won't be intrusive to the guests at your table, um, using hashtag BCKD16. Uh, there's a plasma screen set up in the exhibiting foyer. Both BC Transplant and uh, PRA will be live tweeting through the event. 
Also, just a special note about um, the Wilma Crockett um, Wine and Cheese and Award um, reception this evening. Um, the recipient of the Wilma Crockett Award this year is Dr. Mahmoud Karim. Congratulations. <laughs> Years of service in our community, well, well earned, and we look forward to honoring his contribution this evening. So the theme of this meeting, as I said, is transitions, the kidney patient journey. And as the committee was putting this um, group of ideas together, we really do use your feedback from previous meetings. And this theme just really came out and spoke to us because we realized so much of what we do in caring for our patients is trying to ease transitions, decide what appropriate transitions are for them, and facilitate those transitions. So we'll he be hearing that um, theme recurring throughout the meeting. And I just wanted to take a special moment here to thank on everyone's behalf the organizing committee. It's a group, a multidisciplinary group from all over the province who comes together. We meet frequently throughout the year, we go through the meeting agenda, make sure that different ideas are well represented. Um, so please thank the organizing committee for the hard work in putting this meeting together and we hope you do enjoy it. I just wanted to um, give a special thanks as well to our generous sponsors today. Uh, special thanks go to our platinum and gold level sponsors, um, with the platinum sponsors being Amgen Canada, Janssen and Fresenius Medical Care Canada, and the gold level sponsor being Otsuka. Um, please uh, see the sponsor booths, they're really prominently displayed right outside here um, in the foyer um, and our meeting wouldn't be possible without their support so we do appreciate if you can visit their booths for a chat. A few brief final reminders, the poster displays are set up on the third floor foyer. We've got 22 posters, lots of interesting things to look at um, and remember please to um, vote for posters, there's different categories. Um, don't leave anything in this meeting room because you're going to be moving on. Um, similarly to the other rooms too, there will be easy flow in this meeting throughout the venue, but please take all your belongings with you. Um, and there's accreditation certificates um, available for CME, um, 12 MOC credits for this, for this meeting. So I think I've taken a few extra moments with the opening remarks. Um, so I would like to get on uh, with the first part of the meeting. We're pleased to have um, two executive leaders from PHSA here today um, to provide the formal opening remarks. Uh, firstly, Mr. Carl Roy, who's president and CEO of PHSA. He has more than 30 years of experience in both private and public health care, um, involved with commitment to innovative change, very people-focused management, um, and he's been CEO for a variety of um, health um, authorities before coming here. Also, Colleen Hart, who's Vice President, Provincial Population Health, Chronic Conditions and Specialized Populations. Um, and she has in her portfolio both the BC Renal Agency and BC Transplant. So um, please welcome Mr. Roy for saying a few words of introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Carolyn, and good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, I'm intrigued by uh, sitting up the front and you have incentives. Uh, I think I've discovered one of the incentives. So for those of you at the back that don't have a seat yet, uh, the mystery continues. So please come up to the front. <laughs> uh, look, it's my pleasure uh, to, uh, to welcome you to this annual conference. I've been here now a number of years and, and uh, to celebrate your, uh, your excellent work. And, and I too know that many of you have traveled from across the country. So a special welcome to those of you especially if you're from Manitoba and Saskatchewan and have managed to escape the early snow. So more than anything else today, my message is very simple. It's to give you um, a terrific and uh, well-deserved thank you. A thank you uh, not just for uh, making the trip and giving the time to this uh, important meeting, but for your leadership in service, teaching, and research and for what you do every day to improve uh, the patient experience and improve our provincial system for kidney care. Now, BC Renal and BC Transplant uh, have been doing extraordinary work, uh, and uh, Colleen and uh, Adira and David are going to, to talk more about this, uh, so I won't steal their thunder. But I do want to mention uh, an example 
uh, that's very near and dear to my heart, and, and it's uh, the collaboration between BC Transplant and BC Renal. Um, you know, when you look at, and you know this, but uh, when you look at uh, the majority of the transplants being renal transplants, both living and deceased, uh, very important to move beyond just the niche of get the organs to understanding the importance of the organs as an option along the journey of patients requiring kidney care. And so tremendous work has been done uh, to uh, really focus on that uh, patient journey and the entire continuum, and uh, terrific things have happened. Organizational boundaries have been surpassed, capacity has been built, and we've moved uh, just in uh, transplant to, I think, the lowest performer many years ago in solid organ transplants to one of the top performers now, and uh, living as well. So it is a, uh, a great example, and um, it's really your achievement and is worth celebrating. Uh, every year it seems to move and advance to uh, a different level. So the real, uh, you know, when I think about how does this happen, it, it really happens, and, and you know this, but I want to reinforce it because it's such a huge example for the rest of the health system here and, the health, and health systems elsewhere. It's to be first and foremost driven by those that you serve and what they need. It's being clear about your population. It's being very clear about all of the points in the continuum of care. And it's, it's, it's being very clear about the outcomes you wish to achieve, how you're going to do it. And you know, I found uh, even in kind of my rarefied air and the politics and the interorganizational politics that it doesn't matter who you're talking to, maybe save and accept for the CEOs who are, you know, we have different issues that we have to address. But when you're firmly rooted in what's in the best interest of the patient and the patient experience, the walls come down. And I think the um, uh, BC Renal Service collaboration with Transplant is a testament to that. And it's a model for, uh, for uh, really everyone. I mean, it's a great success story. And I wanted to just uh, tell you how, a little bit about how we're leveraging that uh, uh, that model and your great work elsewhere within PHSA. So we're following this in uh, BC Cancer as we've worked with the Ministry of Health, <coughs> pardon me, and our health authority colleagues to really develop a new provincial policy for uh, cancer control and treatment in the province. And it's a continuum wide approach it's getting us into very, very challenging issues like how do you bring uh, standardization and better outcomes to surgical oncology, things that have not been traditionally a part of a pr provincial cancer control strategy. So again, looking at the entire patient journey, looking at what we need to do collectively to improve the experience and outcomes for those that we serve. We're also following this same example with uh, BC Emergency Health Services. This is the provincial ambulance service in the province. And we're working with our health authorities to look at new and innovative ways to stop uh, seeing ambulances parked at emergency departments for hours on end, but to get the patients where they need to be and get those ambulances back on the road to serve people. And we're also looking at alternative ways other than moving everybody that's in an ambulance to, uh, to uh, an emergency department we're looking at different alternatives for how we treat people effectively short of uh, transferring them uh, in, uh, through emergency departments into the system. And it's also the same model of partnership we're following in uh, the development of a brand new facility uh, through our mental health and substance use services. Uh, this new facility will be at uh, the existing revenue uh, Riverview site. So I wanna thank you for your continued work and just know that not only are you doing exceptional things for your patient population and enhancing the patient experience, but you're creating an example that we're certainly uh, leveraging as much as we can uh, through PHSA. And I would encourage you to, uh, where you can, go back to your organizations to say, if we've done it here for patients with, uh, that need kidney care, then we can do it everywhere else. 
leverage your model. It's exceptional. So thank you. And I hope you leave here uh, inspired and energized and enthused. And uh, we all know that when that happens, and I've been here probably five, six years now, great things happen throughout the year. And I can come back next year and hopefully tell you something different as a result of your wonderful accomplishments. So now um, I'm going to turn it over to Colleen Hart. You know who she is. And uh, Colleen will, um, will uh, give you more detail uh, about uh, her work. Well, thank you, Carl. Good morning and welcome to everybody. I want to first uh, acknowledge that we're meeting on ancestral, traditional, and unceded Aboriginal territories of the Musqueam, Stolo, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations, on whose territory today uh, we are united in community to share and learn from each other. I want to start by offering my sincere appreciation for your caring and dedicated work for the patients that we serve. You do it in partnership, putting patients and their families in the centre, working with your local interdisciplinary teams, being supported by your health authorities' leadership, and with the overarching support of the provincial renal and transplant agencies, which are part of Provincial Health Services Authority. As Carl said, um, I joined um, Fraser Health, uh, from Fraser Health, where I had many opportunities to lead a variety of clinical programs across a health authority. What I love about the work I'm doing now is to lead and work with people across the province. That provincial view uh, is amazing, and it's models like this that make the work worthwhile. I have opportunity with my portfolio because of renal and transplant and other programs to actually look at, study, and implement the model. I've been impressed with the tremendous success of these agencies and the patient outcomes to which each of you contribute. I've had the opportunity to study structures, supports, your levels of collaboration, and apply those learnings to other areas. The renal and transplant networks work. It's because the mandate and the governance are clear. Leadership at the provincial and the health authority levels is also clear. Individuals and teams have come to see that better together is the right mantra, that province-wide collaboration and coordination can work. It's not a competitive model, and that's because it's patient-centered. It's focused on every person in BC affected by kidney disease. It's focused on proving the health and the lives of that population. The renal agency, the transplant agency, and by that, I include all of the health authority partners, have structures, supports, tools, and resources in place to deliver on the best quality outcomes for the individuals we serve. This collaborative model also works because of four key attributes. Firstly, as Carl said, and I want to reinforce, is you know who you're serving. You know your population. Secondly, you know how to best serve through best practices, standardization. Thirdly, you've identified ways for individuals and teams to make consistent, guided, genuine, caring contributions to the patients. And lastly, the attribute of quality improvement. You've embedded ways to be better every day. These four attributes are practices of servant leadership. Oprah Winfrey spoke about servant leadership, and she said when you choose the paradigm of service and look at life through that paradigm, it turns everything you do in your job into a gift. I hope you know you're serving well. I've also had the opportunity to participate in many committee meetings, and I see the passion, I see the sense of community, and I see these servant attributes. There's stewardship of resources, and it's paramount in your discussions. Members are so committed to keeping the patients at the center, whether they're at the beginning or the end of their life journey. I want to take these observations and the attributes of this provincial model and continue to apply them, apply it, sorry, to the rest of my programs. And as Carl gave some examples, we're working to do that right across our health authority as a whole. You've created something great here, and it's my privilege to serve and support you. My sincere thanks for your contributions and your fabulous work. I encourage you to build community today as you learn together, and I trust you're going to have a great two days. Thank you for the opportunity to be here.
Uh, we'll move right on then to the updates uh, from BC Transplant and from BC Provincial Renal Agency. I'll quickly introduce uh, Dr. Landsberg. I think he probably needs no introduction in this crowd. Uh, very busy in the community for 30 years uh, with transplant and now the uh, renal uh, or the medical director of um, transplantation. Uh, instrumental in helping build this partnership that we've just been hearing so much about. So Dr. Landsberg. Uh, thanks, everybody. Good morning. Uh, great to be here for uh, BC uh, Renal Days. Uh, it seems like BC Renal Days for me is the beginning of fall always. Um, good stuff comes with that uh, sometimes if you wait long enough. Uh, return to uh, playoff baseball. Uh, so, uh, you know, last year I gave uh, a reflection on something which probably happened 20 years ago, uh, which I remembered well happened on uh, BC Nephrology Days when uh, the Blue Jays lost, I think, in, it was 1993 in one of the games of, uh, before the World Series and it bombed. So that's all I'm going to talk about baseball today. Uh, so, but I, I, I am going to probably uh, share, you know, information which uh, you all are the contributors to, uh, to sort of help us uh, be proud, but also uh, create a challenge for going forward as well. So I think, you know, uh, this is sort of uh, where, where we're at and where we're going. Um, so, you know, BC Transplant, as you know, provide the, the oversight and, and, uh, and are responsible for the, the, the care model for pre, peri, and post uh, transplant patients uh, across all organs. And because of that, the organ donation and the organ transplant, we are we're unique in Canada. And I think, you know, we can show some of the things that we've done is, you know, it's a great way to do it. Uh, we have uh, three uh, operational goals as part of the PHSA mission. It's very clear, succinct. We want to increase our organ donation. We want to reduce the number of patients on the waiting list, and we want to improve the care that we provide for patients, uh, their families, and for donors and their families. So this is the uh, this is the, the bragging, and I, I think you know uh, I, I take no credit for any of this. This is this was. Uh, this is done beyond uh, beyond my, you know what I've been able to do. I think you know BC Transplant has gone as Carl said actually, you know if you look over on the left uh, left part of the slide, or I'm not sure if it's which way is left, but anyway if you look earlier, if you look early, if you look earlier, uh, we, we were we we're right down at the bottom. Uh, you know our organ donation rate. This is for deceased donors in the country was as you know about as low as uh, as anybody. And look over there on you know look over there to the other side uh, in uh, in 2015. Um, maybe aside from very small provinces where the you know two donors changes the per capita rate by a large amount, uh, we we gone right to the top. Um, CBS issued a report card on how we've been doing, and these are some of the factors which have been identified as being leading practices in order to promote uh, deceased donation. And you can see all the greens uh, under BC. Uh, you know, we we have been pioneers in uh, in in bringing the, these leading practices forward, and it's mostly about you know our connection with ICUs and the idea that that. Donation is part of end-of-life care. It is part of the care that that uh, in intensive unit uh, intensive units provide to families uh, who are losing a loved one, and we're normalizing that you know that practice. And we have individuals now identified in key intensive care units across the province whose role is to uh, is to uh, introduce and uh, bring through the idea of organ donation for these people. So you can see, uh, you know, deceased donation um, down there at uh, eight per million population. Last year we exceeded 20 per million population. That's all donors. Not every donor can be a kidney donor because of, uh, you know, issues with the kidneys. So 18 per million uh, uh, British Columbia donors for kidneys per population. Um, and we grew it by mostly, in a large part, by adopting donation after cardiac death. And so the in the upswing and the uptake of donation after cardiac death, and now which which really puts a tremendous amount of stress and uh, you know very resource intensive, very emotionally intensive for for our colleagues in the intensive care units and the operating rooms, 
people have embraced that and our, you know, our donation after cardiac death numbers have grown and grown, and that's really been a large driver of our increase in deceased donation. We've always been up there by, for a living donation, and uh, you know we stay right up there. And so I'm going to challenge us in a minute. But uh, you know, on, on the other hand, I'm very proud of our uh, living donor programs, which have always been uh, leading the country. And you can see that uh, you know we actually lead the country by by quite a lot. Um, and so if you put it all together, um, these are our numbers. And uh, you know this is not. Uh, uh, this is not made up. Uh, we, we, are, we are so far above any other province uh, th that it is really something to, to say th th this isn't just an anomaly. You know, we're, we're doing some things right here. And so, you know, our, our, uh, our kidney transplant rate um, is uh, almost 50% higher than, uh, th than in uh, even Ontario and Quebec. Uh, you know, they're, 40, they're, the, they're at the call to action target rate maybe of 44. We're all the way up to 60. Um, and so our success, though, has been really based on the fact that we've always had a very successful living donor program, but our deceased donor program had not been so successful. And so some people say, well, that, that always goes. So if you have high deceased, you, ha you don't need living donations so much, so you have low living donor rates. If you have low deceased donor rates, then by necessity, people are going to look more at, at, at uh, living donation. What we want to do is be the leaders on both. So one, one, you know, it is a one competing with the other. It, it's the two complementing each other, and there's absolutely no reason why living donation should not continue to grow while we maintain our very high, uh, our very high deceased donor rates. And if we do that, we really are, you know, doing as well as you know, really leading the world in terms of that because there is that reciprocal relationship. So we're proving that that does not need to be the case. Um, so in terms of our living donors, you can see that th th there's a switch. Um, look at the, uh, the, the slide on, uh, on your right, um, where you can see that uh, the, the typical donor, the relative, you know, my brother, my sister, uh, my, my mother, my father, you know, are still uh, willing donors, but the uh, friends, uh, more distant uh, uh, relationships, and even strangers in, uh, are, are making up more and more of our donor population. And so just uh, you know, to show you where we're at today, 2015 was our best year ever uh, with uh, 95 donors. And this year, as of, I think we're probably three more donors since, uh, since uh, September 30th at least. Uh, so we're right, on we're right on target with last year. Um, and this is the overall numbers, not only for kidneys, but I'll show you for everything. We had a record number last year where certainly, you know, we're within 25% of that number with 25% of the year left. So we're optimistic that we will match or exceed our record number from last year for deceased donation. Um, and just, you know, to show you that in terms of the, our commitment and our success with uh, kidney pair donation programs, but, uh, the, two on, uh, the two on your, ex on the extreme, uh, I still don't know whether it's your left or your right, but uh, you can see the, the high bars, uh, those are our, our, uh, our, our two adult transplant programs. And in terms of the number of uh, people transplanted, uh, we have the, the which are, we, we have the two largest number of, of uh, w w our success rate really is, uh, is unmatched by other programs. And this is largely because of, our, uh, of the domino transplants which occur when those are started by non-directed anonymous donors. And so these are the number of non-directed anonymous donors. If you have non-directed anonymous donors, then you can drive chains. And at the end of that chain, also the, the bonus of, a, of a, a donor at the end of that chain. So this is a fantastic way uh, for people who really want to help make a difference, who are willing to, be, to, uh, to sacrifice and to, uh, and, and to donate to just a stranger to help. Um, if they can donate into, our, uh, into uh, the paired exchange program, they can create tremendous good. So, this is the challenge. So, and I've just come from an hour where we were brainstorming about this. Um, although we do really well with living donation, there is tremendous opportunity for growth. Uh, Dear will probably show you about 600 patients started dialysis in 2015. We were able to do about 42 uh, preemptive uh, living donor transplants. 
there's absolutely no reason why we can't double or even triple that number. So pr the idea now is that preemptive living donor transplant for the right patient um, is the treatment of choice. They get a preemptive living donor transplant before they need to start dialysis. That's the best treatment for the patient. That's the best treatment for the patient's quality of life. And that's the best treatment that the healthcare system can provide from our stewardship point of view because that's the most cost effective. So in order to do that, we need everybody's help. The idea of preemptive living donation has to start early in the conversation when you're seeing your patients for the first time in the kidney care clinic and you're talking about the natural history and progression. Well, when it gets to the point where you're gonna need something done, think about a living donor transplant, that's, that's the way to go. So we're, going to, we're doing, putting a lot of resources into education and we're gonna help you work with patients and their families to identify living donors. So this shows you that we're doing okay with our preemptives. Those are the, the dark greens in the bottom. We, we still have the highest number of preemptive living donor transplants across the country, but we can do better. As far as our wait list goes, we always talked about our terrible wait list stats in terms of the long, long wait. Uh, things are getting better. Um, so if this means if you started dialysis in 2010, the majority of patients who started uh, uh, dialysis in 2010 have received a transplant by the end of 2015. So that's significantly better. So we're doing well. This is for deceased donors. And we're shortening the time for patients on dialysis, but we still have some big challenges, especially in blood group B. So blood group B patients are about 25% of our wait list, but make up about 12% of our donors. So there's a big imbalance there, and every, anything that we can do to help our blood group pa B patients get transplants from getting more blood group B donors, but we're not gonna, you know, you know you're not gonna tell blood group B people to be reckless and do, do things <laughs> that are gonna make, make them be, uh, be organ donors, but, but uh, there are, there are, there's definitely, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's fair to say that there are uh, some challenges that we have with, with some, of, some, of our, uh, some of our Canadian population uh, who are more likely to be blood group B in whom in the, within their communities the idea of organ donation hasn't penetrated as deeply as it could. So that's our challenge. Um, our outcomes are great. Um, so you can see that these are survival curves and you, you can see that, you know, uh, we're over 90% for patient and graft survival for, you know, for a, a number of years after the transplant. And these are the outcomes compared to the uh, Canadian averages and you can see that we do as well, if not better than the, the, than the Canadian averages for both living donors and deceased donors. Um, you know, we encourage uh, donation after cardiac death. We also are willing to look at donors who are older and older, realizing though that there is a bit of a sacrifice. If you get a transplant from an older donor, then the outcomes are, are, are not necessarily gonna be as good. Again, a reason though, though, though deceased donation is good, living donation is better. Uh, doing really well with rejection. You know, in the old days, we would have 50% acute rejection rates. Look at those acute rejection rates. They're like, you know, 10% of less of patients have an acute rejection. So in general, though, transplant is never a slam dunk. Uh, out outcomes are really good. Uh, patients uh, are living a long time. They're living a better life. They're living an a more enjoyable life. They're le leading a less costly life for us. So transplant in every way, shape, or form makes sense. Uh, this is to show you that across the province, our patients are doing about equally well. Now, BC Transplant have produced an annual report which is able to break it down by transplant centers. These are the, the overall numbers, and some of these make up, the differences made are maybe made up by case mix, so they can be a little bit deceiving, but in general, seeing that, the, that we're doing really well across the province. This is the graph survival, and this is really hard. Uh, so I was here at the beginning. <laughs> Uh, it's 30 years. That's insane. <laughs> Thank you. I guess you're clapping because I managed to survive 30 years. <laughs> But, you know, uh, we actually grew, grew, grew this from nothing. Uh, this was an idea, B B BC Transplant, and it was a new idea. And uh, I think at the beginning, the government was hedging their bets, and they were a little bit nervous when they saw me walk in the room because uh, 
St. Paul said, well, this is our guy, and I was about, uh, well, I was probably 30, but I looked about 12. And, <laughs> uh, but everybody, t so I, I'm incredibly grateful that everybody took me somewhat seriously, and <laughs> we've grown to this point. But so it's, it's, a, it's a big milestone for BC Transplant, 30 years, and this October is our 30th anniversary month, and so we're having some uh, publicity on an ongoing basis uh, for, for, for our 30 years. Uh, I don't know much about Twitter, but I know that uh, probably the hashtag 30 days of transplant it has something to do with Twitter, so check that out. And I uh, just want to thank everybody for all their hard work, their dedication, and their commitment to our, our patients, their families, and our donors. And uh, if you can identify everybody in the picture, uh, you maybe get a little reward. Peggy has gone on. Peggy's gone on nationally, so Peggy was our communications manager for a number of years. Uh, and. Uh, She's now working for Canadian Blood Services, and uh, Maureen uh, is front and center, and she was here 30 years ago, and uh, here she is sitting right in the front row looking at her right now, so thanks everyone. I'll just, uh, without further ado then, turn the podium over to Dr. Levin, who will give us an update from the Provincial Renal Agency. So uh, thank you and uh, welcome again to BC Kidney Days and it's hard for me to think how I'm going to um, top all those great statistics that David showed you um, but what I'm going to try and do is give you a sense in 15 minutes uh, which won't do it justice with all the work that, uh, that we as a community have done. And so I'm going to give you an overview of kidney disease and tell you, for those of you that are new about the model and for those of you that are older, remind you about the model that Colleen and uh, that uh, Carl were telling you about that makes it so different and then uh, welcome some of our new faces. So this audience well knows that one in 10 people in Canada and certainly in British Columbia are affected by kidney disease in some way. That's a statistic that actually is quite sobering. It doesn't mean that everybody goes on to dialysis or needs a transplant, but it does mean that they're at risk for all sorts of um, bad things, including infections, heart disease, and hospitalizations. In this province, we know about 14,000 people, um, and we take care of 14,000 people not on dialysis. That's not everybody with kidney disease. Those are the people that are referred to, to uh, kidney doctors. Um, we have uh, over 3,000 people on dialysis, and I think importantly, while we're rem reminiscing about time, 50 years ago in this country, um, having kidney failure was actually a death sentence because there wasn't dialysis and there wasn't transplantation. So that's pretty impressive where we've come to, to, now, to now. In the last 10 years, we've grown our CKD population so that we're managing people uh, better um, in the early phases of kidney disease. And we actually have increased our access to dialysis appropriately for those people that um, aren't eligible for transplant or can't have one. And this is just showing you total dialysis on your far left. <laughs> I'll get it. I'll take it from David. So just a sense of the fact that we have all been working very hard and we've grown these populations. Uh, but importantly, a lot of people have stayed in non-progressive phases of kidney disease or managed to get a preemptive transplant, as David's talking about. Um, so our vision, and I think it's always nice to sometimes stop and reflect what is our vision, it's to have an innovative integrated health system that results in outstanding care for patients living with kidney disease. And again, patients are the front and center of all the things that we do. And what we try and do and uh, integrate all the time is knowledge and practice for better kidney health. And you'll notice that the word kidney disease is not there in the mission because this is about being healthy with kidney problems. We have six health authorities and 11 home hemo training sites. We have 12 PD clinics, 13 hospital dialysis units, 14 CKD clinics, and 27 community dialysis units in one province. And uh, I'm happy to say that this is an integrated system that I think exists nowhere else quite this way in any other province. Um, you've seen this diagram many times, and I am fond of showing it to people. That patients in the community are at the center People live not in a health center, but rather in their community, and we need to remember that, and we've done a lot of work trying to keep people in their communities in every way. Regional health authorities actually offer a myriad of activities, and then we have the renal um, uh, health authority renal programs around that. 
And the renal agency in the large purple um, circle around is really there as a facilitator, organizer, uh, and multiplier, if you will, or amplifier of the good work that's going on in the different health authorities. And we give overarching support, but remember that it's us, it's not an us and them. And I think that's an important thing for to remember. We have many, many committees. Um, these are multidisciplinary committees that have cross-health authority representation. We have now annual work plans with clear deliverables, and we're incorporating more and more research evaluation and continuous quality improvement so that we actually um, have a true, uh, in real time, um, uptake of, of um, new things that we learn. I'm just gonna quickly go through and it's not gonna give it justice, the amount of work that's been going on in each of those committees, just to give you a feel for it. Um, so in the Kidney Care Committee, the, the, uh, there's an adult and pediatric um, um, training materials for patients that can be watched at home. There's booklet forms. Working collaboratively with the Palliative Care Committee, there's now a conservative care pathway. We are in integrating system care, uh, system assessment management in a formal way in all of those uh, with MedRec, and there's monthly online education seminars for general practitioners and others, which are highly subscribed to. I'm very impressed that about 50 or more GPs sign up once a month to listen uh, to and learn about kidney disease, which I think is great. So for the live poll, I almost missed it, Gloria. Uh, what percentage of kidney care clinics with GFR less than 20s opt for conservative care over dialysis or transplant? This is a question for you to use your app. That was fast. <laughs> to read the answer, right? So the important thing about this is until we introduced um, the notion that you could actually not have dialysis but still be cared for, that wasn't, people were not necessarily um, opting for this. So the answer, the right answer is 25% um, of patients actually opt for conservative care when given all the options uh, and are supported through that. That's worth knowing. Next slide. Um, the Palliative Care Committee um, has developed a, a Palliative Care Quality Data Indicators Report, have supported um, using the symptom burden identification in dialysis and CKD with the symptom checklist, and this is available uh, in Promise, and we're working on making um, apps and ways that we'll be able to look at this in more real time. And there's a research um, component to the palliative care group that completed two studies using the prognostication model um, to predict mortality and also to look at the validity of some of the models that are actually in the... Um, in the literature to see that it does and doesn't work as well. So trying to really apply uh, what we know to what we do. And there's also an ACP video guide that you can use. Uh, the Home Hemo Committee has done an amazing job of uh, offering additional uh, treatments or additional methodology to patients. So there's a next stage machine. There's a series of materials to support those programs. We've got provincial tools and protocols to help support patients and programs so that we can actually look more critically at why it is that people, although they want to be independent, still balk at it. And so trying to really increase those numbers. And we've been managing the provincial contracts and actually have a home therapies research group as well. Um, so we've actually published some uh, papers and we have a number of fellows that are working so again trying to demonstrate to the world what we're doing because we do a great job but now we need to actually also uh, write about it and talk about it so next live poll question when was the Pro provincial home hemodialysis program launched in 2000 2004 2010 or in 1986 So although home hemo was available in 1986 in this province, the provincial program launched, as you know it is, in 2004. <laughs> so it's 13 years that we've been doing home hemo in this province, which is pretty impressive. Um, 
So uh, the PD committee also has rolled out a new program called PD Assist, and again on the, on the theme of patient-centered care. This is to actually, when people break their arms or their legs or their person that helps them at home can't actually help them anymore, we've actually got a system in place that actually recognizes that so they don't have to transition to hemodialysis. And uh, this was actually published, is, it's in press in uh, Peritoneal Dialysis International. Um, there are online e-learning modules, we have updated Dated the ways that we can understand better why people leave PD so that we can address those uh, through some data collection activities in uh, Promise. We've got a lovely collaboration with BCIT so we can actually have online advanced PD courses and again they, they mesh with the Home Therapies Research Group to try and make sure that we have an integrated approach to this thing this as well. There's a new committee called hemodialysis. It took us the longest to get that because there was the most uh, disparity and various other reasons, but they also have created a number of different tools that are available online and actually some integrated visiting and traveling patient guideline materials, which believe it or not, did not exist. Although we said that people could travel freely in this province, it wasn't that easy to travel freely in this province for various uh, reasons that when we broke down uh, the barriers was quite simple to fix. And so now we're happy to be able to uh, let anyone go anywhere in the province. Uh, and also some safety issues, because not everybody is ready to go home after they've had a hemodialysis treatment if they're shaky or they've had medicines, and that's never been done before. So this readiness to leave the hemodialysis unit guideline is something quite novel and interesting as well. And of course, they're in the process of developing some quality data indicators to make sure that we can uh, look and compare and improve at all times. The glomerulonephritis committee, it's a rare disease, but this province is the only province that has a um, provincial formulary for uh, this, these medications. Make sure that all patients have access to the state-of-the-art care guidelines and protocol, and that's been a great boon uh, to the patients. And I just uh, would like to ask people if they know, people in the kidney care clinics may or may not, how many cases of GN are diagnosed in British Columbia each year? 50, 125, 300, or 450. And what you might not know is that GN is the third most common cause to go on to dialysis in this province. It's just that it takes a long time, um, and usually it affects younger people, so we don't get... So the answer to that... It's actually 450. So, yeah, quite a lot. The biopsy guys are busy. Um, so the Pharmacy and Formulary Committee um, manages all the contracts, provides a number of patient and provider tools and resources, how to use medicines, how to address symptomatology. Um, we're evaluating uh, new therapies to try and make sure that we advocate and understand how best to use them, review nutritional supplements for both children and adults, and we've been participating in uh, a CanSolve CKD study on uh, deprescribing. So there's a big movement now to actually take people off medicines that they don't need and do that in a systematic way and evaluate how well they do, and, and we're involved in that in a national way. Um, led by Bill Kane, we have an emergency management committee, so we actually know what to do um, if things go wrong um, in various places around the uh, province. We haven't had to actually implement much. Uh, there was a, about 10 years ago, there was a fire in Penticton. We were going to maybe have to move everybody from Penticton um, to somewhere else. And, uh, and so we'd, we've had some close calls, but never had to implement this. But I think everybody's ready for it. Um, newly, and you'll hear about this later this morning, we have the only provincial registry that we're aware of of polycystic kidney disease. That's a first in Canada. And we've developed some patient and provider resources, again, a first in Canada, um, so that we'll actually be able to understand the trajectory of this inherited disease. Um, and we've actually implemented, again, first in Canada, the a tuberculosis screening program for all new dialysis patients. This may sound like very easy to do, but it's actually not so easy to do. Patients with kidney disease don't respond to the old-fashioned spot test. They need a special test. And so we've actually been able to roll that out across uh, the province uh, with a little bit of help from our friends at BCCDC and uh, actually uncovered 38 cases of latent tuberculosis, which is actually a big deal because that's important for their transplant. It's important for um, the rest of the people in the unit and their families. And that means that we can actually treat them uh, before they actually... Uh, do anything else. So that's been a really amazing eye-opener. Uh, other highlights are that we have these e-learning sessions for primary care that I told you about. We're very involved in the World Kidney Day Kidney Smart campaign. 
And for the last, I think, live poll question, um, how many people do you think visited our kidneysmart.com web, web page last March when we did Kidney Month? 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, or 20,000? And Gloria will tell me the answer. Hmm? So the answer is 15,000, so you got that right. So congratulations to the people that put that together and, uh, and keep it going. We have, the, we have a patient experience survey, and I'm actually, this is quite amazing. So the patient experience survey is a McCall survey validated in Canada for chronic disease. It's not specific to kidney disease, and what it does is it tells us how our patients perceive their experience in a chronic uh, disease milieu. And I think this is, you'll, we're going to have posters for you in each of your units. All, um, this got sent out to all patients, CKD patients and dialysis patients, uh, not to transplant patients, David, but we can talk about uh, how to do that. And basically have very good results. Most people feel that they were getting well, very well organized care, that they have a lot of participation, and that they, um, manage, we manage their health beyond just their physical health. But uh, in terms of things that we can do better is uh, goal setting in a concrete way and um, linking them with other health, authority, health community resources. And we can talk about how we do that and we're going around the province. But this is a, a quite impressive uh, survey to have done. We've done it three times and I think it's uh, very instructive for us. So just moving forward, because we, we always can't just stay still, um, what we're trying to do is have a multi-year application roadmap for PROMISE so that we can actually um, use it to its uh, fullest and its best. It's again an integrated system that allows uh, it to interact at the moment um, with some of the health authority systems, but not as many as we would like. And we're proactively planning facilities. The ministry asked us for a 10-year plan of what kind of facilities we want. <clears throat> and we keep looking very fiscally responsibly at our funding model, how we manage our contracts to really try and make sure we're getting the best uh, that we can for everything. What we're trying to continue to do is deliver outstanding patient-centered care. We uh, have officially our PREMS, our patient uh, reported experience measure is that survey I told you about. PROMS is patient reported outcome measures and we're gonna formalize that. And again, we're probably the only place in Canada that's doing that as a community as opposed to one-offs in different centers. As this meeting focuses on transition, so, are, uh, so is the community looking at this in a very real way as how to hand off, uh, have advanced care planning, uh, collaboration with transplantation independence so that people really get the right treatment at the right time in the trajectory of their condition. And uh, we are trying to develop a strategic framework because there are some very expensive new medicines which are life changing and life saving and we don't have access to those. And how do we get that? And we've got a telehealth project uh, that uh, Anurag Singh is leading in the north looking at indigenous and rural communities, but also we're doing that in the context of some other initiatives. And the GN network and our polycystic kidney initiative and looking at some synergies in Colleen's portfolio across other groups with cardiac disease and uh, other things is something that we're really working towards uh, so that we can actually enhance the mandate and uh, stay integrated and yet still focused on patients. And we're trying to leverage our research and knowledge to foster change. So we're, as many of you know, and you'll hear more about at some point, is this CanSolve CKD, which is a national CIHR uh, strategy for patient-oriented research. And we actually, our, our BC is pr uh, figuring prominently in that uh, initiative. And we're having a number of different ways that we can educate and learn across Canada on how best to deliver uh, care in the 21st century and offer our patients the best uh, that we can. So the network works because of all of you and because we stay patient focused. Um, in case you don't know how much money we spend a year, we spend $170 million uh, this year for protected renal funding, which is 95% directed to patient care services, drugs and facilities, not to administration and infrastructure. And I think that's something quite remarkable. Um, and it's because we all um, work collaboratively within our day jobs to make sure that the greater whole is looked at. We have matrix government governance, which is a little bit confusing for people, but we try and make it work and uh, just needs a lot of education and all the provincial contracts. So this is just an overview of, of the vis various pieces that go into making um, our network work so well. So we together have managed to delay the progression of kidney disease, 
have really terrific outcomes on dialysis, uh, have a lot of independent dialysis modalities and a variety of them. We're trying to increase preemptive transplantation as per David's comments and make sure that the patients really have the medicines that they need the most. We have lots of quality improvement initiatives across all the different health authority programs and they're funded by the value add uh, things and again this is important directed dollars to make sure that we achieve what we want. Uh, there are a number of posters around of these achievements and I'd like to encourage you as Carolyn did to go and look at them uh, and they're also on our website so if you want to go back and look at them later. Um, so the just to conclude the only way that this network stays vibrant is that we actually need to reinvest in people. And so we actually have advanced, um, working with uh, UBC, have supported advanced training fellowships for people um, around the world, actually, as well as within our own community. And that interchange of what goes on in Australia and Canada and Ireland and our ability to share that is exemplified in these home therapy and advanced nephrology trainee people and our administrative fellowships um, that Mike Bevilacqua and Elizabeth Lee are doing with focuses in different areas, one in PKD and optimizing um, access to models of care and Elizabeth's focusing on hemodialysis and these are ways that we actually grow and, and maintain the community uh, with leadership as well. The clinic, whoops, uh, and then we have core training nephrology fellows, renal transplant fellows, pediatric nephrology, and new nephrologists. So uh, overall, um, we're actually doing a job of renewing, because as David and I will tell you, we've now been here a long time and we need some renewing. Um, <laughs> this is also the list that we have of the people that, have act that are actually going to be participating in the uh, Certification Nephrology Nursing Program. So there's a long list of nurses here that are going to be taking this, so good luck on the exam, and another example of excellence and renewal that really goes on within this community, which I think we should be very proud of. I have to thank, as everyone else has, all the renal care teams. Around the province, everybody gets up in the morning to do their very best for the patients, and I think that's something really remarkable. And some days it doesn't work so well and things go wrong, um, but most days we're actually all there for the same reason and we're trying to work together. So uh, thank you for all the things that you do. There are people that you don't see. There's the promise team, the statisticians and methodologists and the admin staff, and it's good for us to remember who they are. So there's a picture of them and they are around and they're at the promise booth and around. So thank you to all of you. So just to conclude, what we do is we focus on patients. We focus on knowledge translation. Uh, what we know to what we do is sort of our mantra and what works in the real world so we don't get all hung up and ethereal about things that are like lovely in a scientific paper but actually don't work in real life. And we actually mostly work together to create a system that really makes it better for patients and really optimizes their outcome. So I just want to conclude with a slide that I often conclude with, but it's over 300 people actively work on the committees and professional groups, and that's before you get up and go to work and do your day job. And so that's pretty impressive that we've actually harnessed that kind of energy. Um, and so I think that I keep reminding that BCPRA is not them, it's us, and we all do work together very well, and I thank you very much for the privilege of that. <laughs>